be quickly seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm excited tonight. Amen. Somebody say Monday, Thursday. Tell somebody I'm on a mission. I was so taken and carried away by the sister who ministered the word on tonight. And uh, the brothers were sitting with me and, and uh, we just get excited. Preachers get excited about other preachers. Come on, you ought to be excited about other people and other gifts. Can we celebrate her on tonight? Oh, you can do better than that. Hallelujah. Did she walk that word in here tonight or did she walk that word in here tonight? Pastor, there are only two kind of preachers that make you want to preach. Them that can and them that can. And I believe Sister Girl is one of those that can. Amen. Forgive me for calling you Sister Girl. I'm, I'll, I'll get your name after service and I'll call you by your name right. But you's a show enough tactician preacher. Amen. Amen. Monday, Thursday, she got to talking about Jesus and Judas. On Monday, Thursday is the time where Judas would betray Jesus. And uh, I'm wearing a robe similar to the rabbi's robe in an Anglican tradition of what Jesus would have been wearing that night when he disrobed himself. And I hope I have not been too offensive in some of my high church garb. But as I mentioned to you before, that those of us who are yoke men before the Lord, that we're willing to give our lives for the sake of the gospel and the sash that I wear would be equivalent to the sash that Jesus would have had on that he would have disrobed himself with. And this yoke men or this, this censure around my neck would be likened unto those who have given their lives for the sake of the gospel and for giving their lives for the sake of the truth. So much so that Jesus stayed at the table. I don't know how you stay at the table and you serve people who are going to betray you. Uh, which is to say for those of us who are in the roles that we are in, there will be betrayal, but this too shall pass. Tell somebody, thank God for Monday, Thursday. If it had not been for the betrayal of Judas with a kiss, Jesus would have never gotten to the cross. And if he had never gotten to the cross, he'd have never gotten to the ground. If he never gotten to the ground, captivity would have never been led captive. And you and I would never have the opportunity to now come before the throne of grace boldly before the Father. Ah, to have relationship with the Lord our God. Can you say amen? Tell somebody I'm on a mission. Our theme all week long has been on transformation, moving forward in faith, discipleship, and missions. And if it's all right with you tonight, I'd like to talk to us about missions for a little bit. And I'd like to go back to the book of Luke and read in your hearing chapter 4, verses 15 through 18, and your hearing on tonight. And if you wouldn't mind just one more time standing for the reading of God's word on tonight, I know that we've been worshiping. Can you praise God for our praise and worship team? Really, can you praise God for them? While you're standing and turning there, that, that uh, young lady that uh, y'all saw me kind of embracing, I haven't seen her in a number of months and weeks, and the, the doctors tried to tell her that she was going to have lupus in her lungs and have some difficulty. And uh, the Lord led me, Pastor, as I mentioned, to say to her that as you worship the Lord in your spare time between you and God, that God's going to heal you from the inside. And uh, we gave her an award, and y'all make sure she gets her, make sure she gets her Dominion Faith Award, sir. And I uh, uh, hadn't seen her, so this is my first time just laying eyes on her in a number of months. And she called me, and she said, Pastor, they can't find anything. I'm going to just have church by myself on your behalf. We can't find anything. I said, well, you make sure that you're here tonight and with us on Good Friday service and tell the church and you testify. Isn't our God good? Tell somebody I'm on a mission. Uh, let's look at Luke chapter 4 and verse 14. I want to read in your hearing all the way through probably verse 19 and we'll land there. And in some kind of way, we'll get through this on tonight. Amen. Bible reads this way. Then Jesus returned in the power of the spirit to Galilee. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. And the news of him went through all the surrounding region, and he taught in their synagogues and being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And we had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, his mission. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 
He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Tell somebody I'm on a mission. To proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Would you look at somebody on your right and left and say these words? Say, neighbor, I'm on a mission to move you forward. Let's take the next step. Come on, turn around and talk to somebody else real quickly. Talk to somebody else real quickly. Say, neighbor, I'm on a mission to move you forward. Let's take the next step. Come on, you know what time it is right now. We've been here three days now. You know you got to break protocol in the sanctuary. Go to somebody else. Shake hands with them. Tell them it's good to be with you this weekend, Revival. Come on, tell them, but I'm on a mission to move you forward. Let's take the next step. Come on, since you're out in the aisleway, go to somebody else. Go to somebody else. Go to some of y'all like, I'm tired. I ain't moving. Come on, go to somebody else. Say, neighbor. <laughs> oh, neighbor. <laughs> It's been good this week, but I'm on a mission when I leave here. I got to move somebody forward. That is my mission. Let's take the next step. Come on back to your seat. I want to talk to you from the subject matter. This is my mission to move you forward. Quickly, one more time, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you. God, that you have not called Ebenezer and Calvary together by happen chance. But, Lord, that you are doing something with us in this season and time. Thank you, God, Lord, that you want the kingdom to be made manifest in the city. And, God, your word reminds us, O oh Lord, that in the last days that you will pour out your spirit upon all flesh. And that your sons and daughters would prophesy. And that your young men would dream dreams and your seasoned men would have visions. God, we pray, Lord, that there will be something cataclysmic that happens in our midst. Lord, that you'll thrust us forward, God, into our city so that lives will be transformed and turned around through discipleship and faith and mission. Thank you, God. Speak now through these lips of clay. Help us understand where we are in time. In Jesus' name we pray. Tell somebody that is my mission, to move you forward. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Yeah. I want to just mention to you tonight that all noteworthy organizations or entities are all centered and rooted in a particular vision and in a particular mission. All organizations that have influence and that expand and that grow and that really begin to touch the sectors of what their sphere of influence is or their field that they're called to or their sector, they have a noted particular vision or mission. The vision or mission gives the organization a sense of purpose, a reason for being. It is why people gather or come together, give their lives in a work of service, and find meaning in the reason for being. Tell somebody, I'm on a mission to move you forward. Consider this. The Bible says that vision or mission is so important that in the New American Standard Version of the Bible, if you could put it in that version on the screen, over there it says this where there is no prophetic vision the people cast off restraint but blessed is he that keeps the law in other words vision and mission help people stay on track it gives direction in life and keeps you from rabbit trails it helps you have a sense of direction to know where you're going. Look, look at the verse again for me. Look at the verse again. I, I, I like this part. It says, uh, it says, where there is no prophetic vision or no divine revelation, people cast off restraint. I like that part when it says prophetic vision. See, the PowerPoint about that is this. It says, whenever there is a foretelling of the future, lane assignments are fulfilled. When you get a good, clear glimpse of where you're headed, then you know where you're going. Can I talk right there for a few minutes? When you know where you're headed, you understand what your assignment is. In other words, you don't make decisions based upon the sensory elements of your time. You make decisions about where you're going based upon the prophetic declaration that's over your life. In other words, you don't have time to waste time. When you understand who you are called to and, and who God has called you to be, you don't have time for gossip. 
You don't have time for backbiting and murmuring and complaining. Uh, you don't have time for worldliness when you're on assignment for Jesus. Tell somebody, this is my mission. When we consider our text tonight, Jesus is in a prophetic moment about vision and mission. Now, I know in church ease, when we talk about mission, we are always talking about the work to be done uh, in the third world sense in terms of abject poverty. But Pastor Dean, Pastor Senior, uh, pre preachers who are with me tonight, members, saints, and friends, I, I would simply suggest to you uh, that the spiritual state of America has become our mission field. That we're no longer in the fundamentalist society where there has been an adherence to absolute truth. Pastor Dean, I believe that we have so far now gone to the place where we are beyond being postmodern in America. Uh, where postmodernism is the idea of relative truth. Where we would say to ourselves that what's true for you, Sean, is not necessarily true for me. And that your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. Uh, we've gone to the place now where we are post-Christian. No longer do the Ten Commandments seem to govern a person's morality. We have moved to the place now that whatever feels good, do it. <laughs> we had that song in my time growing up. Well, a little bit beyond me. It's your thing. Do what you want to do. Come on, we in church. I don't want, to, I want y'all to slide all the way back. Stay here. Stay here, stay here, stay here. Uh, you, you know, you, you, this idea that, that I am a, a God unto myself, that my own truth is my own truth. But how many of you know, like I know Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. That no man comes to the Father unless he comes by me. Tell somebody I'm on a mission. We no longer have to travel to find people who have never heard the gospel or the manifestation of the demonic. In America today, Satan is in vogue and flesh is on parade. You can get access to anything that you want to have access to at any moment, at any time, uh, at any time throughout the day. At your fingertips, things can come to you on your phone. In your house right now, your teenager has access to anything and everything all over the world. The base morality is everywhere where all of a sudden now we are in the days where we are calling good evil and evil good. And that's not in the world, but that's in the church. But I came with a word from the Lord tonight to remind the church to live out your call and be on a mission for the Lord Jesus Christ. You ain't got to go to Guatemala or go to Guam or go to Uganda or go to, or go to the remote parts of Africa to find a manifested demon. There are manifested demons that are around you each and every day. They walk up and down the hallways in our high schools and are inside of our principal's offices. There are many of them are operating and are in a functional place where they are inside our city councils. And God knows we got some that are walking around in our White Houses right now. I didn't say that, did I? All over the place, politics has now come to the place where it's taking over the auspices of the church where God has called the church to make sure that we are giving ourselves to the service of the poor. But now, government is now trying to encroach upon us to say, we would love to partner with you and we would love to do things with you. Just don't mention the name Jesus. But just like last night, we understood that God has given him a name that is high above every name. That you really can't deal with the spirit of poverty unless Jesus is at the center. Because truth be told, poverty is a spirit that manifests itself in controlling the minds of people where they make the decisions to be where they are. Remember, the body of Christ at large has a vision and is, I can say it this way, at large is vision-led but mission-driven. Look at somebody and say, we are vision-led but mission-driven. Would you put on the screen for me, Mark 16, 15 through 17, one more time. Jesus says this, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And here it is, and these signs will follow those who believe. That in my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Text continues on. If they drink anything deadly, it shall not harm them. And they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I still believe in an old gospel. 
that transforms and changes people's lives when there is an encounter to be had with the Lord Jesus Christ. Consider Luke 10 and 19 with me one more time. Jesus sending his people out two by two in the different places of the city to declare this gospel, the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God. And he says, behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. Y'all remember that from last night, don't you? And over all, somebody shout all. God has given us power over all the power of the enemy. And he said, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. I think that we have come back to the point where the world is looking for the church to be the church. That we ought to be a peculiar people, a holy nation, people that God has called out of darkness. You can't deliver somebody from darkness if you're still hiding in the dark yourself. We got to become the kind of church where we come all the way out. Lord, don't let me get into that too soon. We got to come all the way out and have a good, clear sense of mission of what God has called us to so that we can be used by God. I believe that this is the greatest hour for the church. It's supposed to get dark outside right now so that God can use us as the light to begin to turn things around for his glory. Put Matthew 28 and 19 on the screen. Let's talk about discipleship real quickly. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, that were nations, ethnos, ethnic groups, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Here it is. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. The Lord says, if you will go and make disciples, I will be with you. It's one thing for your prayer partner to be with you, but it's another thing for God to be with you. It's one thing for the deacons to be with you, but it's another thing for God to be with you. It's good for your pastor to be with you, but it's a whole different thing for God to be with you. He says, if you go and make disciples, I will be with you. Even to the end of the age, the industrial age, God will be with you. Yeah, the technocratic age, God will be with you. The age of reason, God will be with you. Even in this uh, millennial time where we have become post-Christian, God will indeed be with you. Tell somebody I'm on a mission. And in the text tonight, the text with a sense of mission, Jesus with a sense of mission, Jesus with a sense of purpose lays out for each of us as believers and as disciples what our individual and corporate mission and purpose ought to be. Come on, tell somebody I'm on a mission. Come on, tell them I'm on a mission. To move you forward. Come on, y'all not in here yet. Come on, say, Ebenezer, I'm on a mission to move you forward. Come on, Calvary, say, I'm on a mission to move you forward. Before we get to the sense of mission here that is clearly in the text, I I'd be remiss if I didn't just stop by here um, as if I had not been trained in some type of exegesis and hermeneutics to, to really administer to you that before Jesus gets to his sense of mission, the Bible takes time to stop and to say in verse 14 that Jesus returned to Galilee and the power of the Spirit. You, you can't achieve mission without the power of the Spirit. And oftentimes we want to preach with power and witness with power and see miracles and signs and wonders, but we won't wait on God long enough to get the flow of the Spirit in operation of our lives. I said on last night that there's a process to beginning to walk in discipleship and to walk in the power of the Spirit, and the process is to endure temptation. Look at somebody and say, can you endure temptation? In the text here, Jesus is being tempted of the devil for at least 40 days and 40 nights. And as a matter of fact, in verse 1 of Luke 4, the Bible says that he is led into the wilderness by the Spirit. Wait a minute, preacher. You mean to tell me that sometimes the Spirit of God will lead me into a wilderness moment? Yes, it will if you want power with God. God has to push you through a testing of those three areas, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. In the text there, Jesus being led to be tempted of the devil for 40 days. A lot of folk want power, but they haven't conquered themselves nor the devil yet. Can we have church tonight? You can't have power unless you've conquered yourself and the devil. Here it is. The devil tempts Jesus. He says, I know that you're God. In other words, let me translate it. I know you some great wonder, but you hungry right now. Go on and turn this stone into bread. Jesus with resolve stands and says to Satan right in the middle of the wilderness experience, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. 
that our word, that, that the word of God should be the bread that stabilizes us each and every day. You can't really walk in power till the word becomes your sustenance. And the next moment, Satan then, he takes Jesus up to this, this high mountain place and he shows them the kingdoms of the world. And he says, all of this can be yours if you would bow down and worship me. And Jesus with resolve, hungry now, and now at the moment where he has realized he's taken off all of his deity and put on human flesh. And Jesus uh, turns to Satan and said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, but you should worship him and him alone. Until you've come to the place where God has become your God and you've learned to worship him in good times and in bad times, you can accomplish a sense of mission. Where you're willing to do without just to say holy close to Jesus. We got to get back to the place where our worship becomes what we need to make it every day. That if people walk away from us and I still got my worship, I got everything that I really need. That if I don't have all the money that I need, but I got my worship, I got everything that I need to be in relationship with God. That if my money is funny, but I still got my worship, I got everything I need to walk in power with God. That things may not be right in my life the way that I want them to but if God is my portion and I still got worship on my lips oh God and so really I'm saying if God be for you he's more than the world against you that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world is there anybody with a sense of mission in here on tonight would somebody give the Lord glory the church has got to get back to the place where we are still holding on with our hand in the Lord's hand. Because it's going to get worse before it gets better. Can I talk for a few minutes? You think it's bad right now. It ain't got really bad yet. We really are going to come to the days where those of us who really name the name of Jesus, the Bible says in Hebrews that all of those who will live godly shall, shall suffer persecution. That there is coming a time in America where you may not be able to utter the name Jesus. We better worship God in these kind of moments that we are in right now. Because we may not be able to gather together soon, church. That we may really have to be underground and have devotional study. I appreciate the technology, but there's nothing like coming together in the sanctuary. Because in the sanctuary, there is where I find asylum for my own sin. That is where I get forgiveness, and that's where I receive strength. The Bible Bible says it is better to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. Tell somebody I'm on a mission to move you forward. What is critical about this is that whatever the mission field that you are called to or the mission field that you are called to is indicative of the hell that you just came through. Let me say it again. The mission field that you as a disciple are called to is indicative of the not heaven that you just came through. So if alcoholism has been your struggle, that is your mission field. If drug addiction has been your struggle, that is your mission field. If sexual perversion has been your struggle, that is your mission field. If all the crazy people keep coming to you and telling you all their business, it ought to be because you were once crazy, that is your mission field. You, you got to be comfortable in your own screen. Never be ashamed of where God has brought you from. Because that is the goodness of the Lord that you have overcome and that God is carrying you into the next phase of your life. The text says that Jesus after he had been tempted 40 days and 40 nights, returned into Galilee by the power of the Spirit. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't stop and tell you first that before we get to Isaiah 60, the text, the text that he reads, that the Bible says he was in the region of Galilee, but he went to Nazareth. In his going to Nazareth, he's sending a sign. Remember, he is not welcome. Most prophets are not received in their own hometown. Jesus went to the place where he was ridiculed to begin to tell the people the spirit of the Lord is upon me For he has anointed me to preach the gospel. That's why that's why our pastor I say that I, I believe I'm called right here to this peninsula and, and called right here to the Hampton and Newport News because that is in the place first where I, I, I ran the streets and, and acted the fool and was disobedient and, and uh, what ran away from my call uh, when people see me preaching today Sean they know that God is real <laughs> They know that this ain't fake, that this is a real thing that is happening. So if we're going to talk about a sense of mission, let me hasten on and get there. To move forward, our mission, we've got to understand that we've got to first be called to the destitute. Tell somebody I'm called to the destitute. That means the poor. 
Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Pastor Dean, all too often preachers want to take churches because of the flock's potential financial ability. Real ministry is the ability to be a blessing to those that cannot bless you. And look, just because you got money, that don't mean you're not poor. I know we tend to focus on the third world, but we've got destitute people around us every day. Hiding behind nice houses, they're destitute. Hiding behind nice cars, they're destitute. Hiding behind good jobs, they are destitute. Hiding behind 401k plans, they are destitute. Hiding behind intelligence, they are destitute. PhDs and master's degrees, still destitute. I, I like the phrase like this. I like this phrase, glocal. Somebody shout and say glocal. That is my mission. Come on, somebody shout and say glocal. That is my mission. It is a combination between being global and local. When we look at Acts, and it talks about being able to go into all the world and first uh, Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We often think that it's, uh, it's in reference to the sequence of each thing. No, it is actually the conjunction and is there. It is both and at the same time. You ought to travel abroad and cast the devil out and come back home and cast the devil out. You got to do both at the same time. Tell somebody I'm on a mission. See, this is critically important. Look at Matthew 25 and 33. Put that on the screen. Uh, uh, this, this whole thing about ministering to the destitute. Jesus said this, and he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you bless my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Tell somebody I'm on a mission to move you forward. If we're going to be on a mission to move forward in our mission, we've got to understand that only are we called to the destitute, but we are called like Jesus to the disappointed. Tell somebody that is my mission. The text says Jesus said he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. There are so many people in the body of Christ and in the world today that are indeed brokenhearted. And nobody knows how to minister to brokenhearted people like people who have been brokenhearted. Is there anybody in here tonight that you've ever felt brokenhearted because you haven't seen your dream come to pass? You are a prime candidate for the mission of God. I, I, I like this part right here for brokenhearted people. He'll give you beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. <laughs> the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That's not the shout for me. The shout for me is that we might be like trees of righteousness. A planting for the Lord. In other words, you got to be able to go through stuff where you've been but don't break. I'm going to leave that alone tonight. Tell somebody I'm called to the brokenhearted. If, if we're going to be on a mission to move forward in our mission, we've got to understand the call not only uh, to the destitute and the disappointed, but the call to the detained. I'm hastening on. Tell somebody we're called to set the captives free. Yeah, come on. So we're called to set the captives free. Let's, let's, let's look at the Bible again one more time. Look, look, look at it again. Let's, listen to what Jesus said. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. You're really not called, unless, uh, 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 you're really not called to real mission unless you've got the ability to set somebody else free. The Bible says whom the son has set free is free indeed. Look here. Look here. When we think about setting the captives free, we often think about people who are physically on lockdown. And, and that is true. We are called to visit people in prisons and in jails. We are called to go to the General Assembly and go to Congress and to begin to lobby on behalf of the least of these and those who have been disenfranchised and those who find themselves in prisons unjustly. We are called to do that. But when Jesus mentions this, he is talking about people who are in spiritual bondage. Their ability not to be able to discern the Lord. He's talking about people and their inability to be able to see, captive in their thinking, captive
captive in their mind that keeps them in spiritual bondage to sin. They are in habitual processes and behavioral disorders and patterns that keep them locked out of the Lord's grace and locked out of the Lord's mercy. But I got a word for that tonight that whom the Son has set free is indeed truly, truly free. God wants the church to be so involved in setting people free that when we see people, we have a word from the Lord in our mouths that will begin to speak directly to them in the grocery aisle. We got a word in our mouths while we're on the lunch break that will be able to crystallize God's plan and purpose for their lives. When we set the captives free, we have a word in our mouths that will be able to speak to the 15 year old to remind them that you don't have to give in to everything that everybody else gives into, that it is possible for you to keep yourself. We got to have a word in our mouths to minister to people who are on the verge of committing suicide. Tell somebody, that is my mission. We got to be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ today to be able to have a word in our mouths in season to minister to the needs of people that are broken hearted, that feel like there is no hope and that there is no future. Tell somebody, that is my mission. We are called to the people who are locked out and locked down. We are called to the people who cannot see and find their way. We are called to the people who are making a misuse of their lives. People that come into our midst. No longer should it be that somebody can come in the middle of the sanctuary, the place where they find asylum and cannot lift their hands. Oh God, let me go here. The Bible talks about this woman who had a spirit of infirmity that she was so bent over. This is what gets me about it, Jason. What gets me is that she had been coming to church for 33 years. How you come to church for 33 years and bent over and don't nobody notice? That we are so involved in our religious ceremonies and our collars and our robes and the sequence of our services that people come in bound up and then nobody says anything to them for them to get delivered. It's time out for that to stop. Tell somebody I'm on a mission. <laughs> The atmosphere of our services has got to be so enriched with the power of worship in the middle of the service that when God begins to settle into the place that the glory cloud, oh God, that the glory cloud comes. And when the cloud comes, all of a sudden disorders get broken off of people's lives. When the cloud comes, nicotine addictions begin to fade. When the cloud comes, drug addiction begins to leave people. When the cloud comes, homosexuality they leaves people's lives when the cloud comes God somebody help me preach when the cloud comes all of a sudden lesbianism lifts up off of somebody when the cloud comes depression's got to run out when the cloud comes I wish I had somebody who would help me preach in here tonight when the cloud comes that the power of God is made manifest and that the captive is set free it is time out for having church as usual God wants the administration of the kingdom and power to be made manifest in the church. Woo! Oh God. Yeah, I need to go on and get up around here now. The Bible talks about, come on, get this, sir. The Bible talks about Paul and Silas at midnight. I got more word, but we ain't got that much time. That at midnight... Paul and Silas were put inside of a dungeon. And Paul got into trouble for preaching the gospel. He reminded those around him that it is better to obey God than to obey man. And while Paul and Silas were in that dungeon and in that prison, what we fail to understand sometimes, Dre, is that he wasn't in just a normal prison. That Paul was placed inside of a dungeon. He was placed in a place that was at the lowest point. Him and Silas chained to the wall. But the Bible records that at midnight, Paul and Silas begin to sing praises unto God. And the Bible says that there was an earthquake so that everyone's bands were loose. Help me, Jesus. To the point that we remember the worship and the praise in our services. That everybody that has got bands and shackles begin to get free when we begin to lift up a praise before the Lord. This is why we cannot play with praise and worship in service. 
that we got to have the kind of worship before the Lord that caused devils and demons and hells to tremble. The Bible says that as they worship God, that God sent an earthquake to God, that God would send an earthquake in our worship services so that every devil that is holding you, even in your mind right now, has got to loose you and let you go and set you free. That there would be such a Shabbat praise. Why is the praise important? The praise is important because that is our warfare. Your tongue is a sword. When you open up your mouth, the devil can't understand why it is that you continue to give God glory right when you're in the middle of your body aching. Why do you continue to give God glory right in the middle of depression? Why do you continue to give God glory right in the middle of unemployment? Satan can't understand. The Bible says that with the clapping of our hands, it is like thunder in the heavens. And we see summon a heavenly host to come to our rescue but that ain't the shout about it the shout about it is that paul and silas set everybody else free with their praise but paul and silas stayed right there in the dungeon because they had a sense of mission because the, the purpose of Paul and Silas being in that holding pattern was not for the prisoners. Paul and Silas told everybody else, stay where you are. Because Paul understood that the jailer would lose his life if somebody got parole too soon. Can I tell you why you're in what you're really in right now? God help me pray. You're in what you're in right now because your praise is setting somebody else free. You're in what you're in right now because the intensity of your worship is going to loose the bands on somebody else. You're in what you're in right now because somebody else is getting ready to see Jesus. But if you get paroled too early and too soon, you're going to cause somebody else to miss the blessing. You got to be on a mission to stay in your personal prison to stay in your prison until somebody else gets free and learn how to worship the king of kings and the lord of lords right when you're in the middle of struggle right when you're in the middle of strife right when you're in the middle of pain right when you're in the middle of going through it's your praise that sets the oh God, that will set the captive free and if you choose to stay where you are the bible says that paul told the jailer do yourself no harm for we are all still here god help me then the bible goes on to remind them that the jailer went home and set his whole house free when his house got free everybody connected to the jailer got free look at somebody and say neighbor can you go through what you're going through and tell everybody in your house gets free come on say neighbor i'm on a mission i stay where i am and tell everybody connected to me gets free y'all ain't preaching nobody say neighbor i stay what i'm in with a sense of purpose and tell everybody in my house gets free I'll go through what I'm going through and tell everybody connected to me gets free. I'll walk the way I gotta walk and tell everybody close gets free. Is there anybody willing to set somebody free tonight? Hallelujah. Let me let me finish this way. The importance about your mission is to have a good understanding about God's call in your life. When you don't understand why you're called and who you're called to. When you don't understand that you'll make haphazard decisions. And what is great about this is that Paul and Silas understood their sense of mission. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are captive. Here it is. And the acceptable year of the Lord which is really jubilee and god wants jubilee in our city pastor <laughs> god wants jubilee in our city jesus asked peter an interesting question he said who do men say that i am y'all know that story but oftentimes we miss the the end of it we know that jesus is the christ the christos the anointed one who would come 
But at the end of the story there, Jesus says, Peter, because you are who you are and have a revelation of who I am, he says, I'm going to give you keys to the kingdom. <laughs> and everything that you bind on earth, I'm going to bind in heaven. And everything that you loose on earth, I'm going to loose in heaven. Because you have a revelation of who, am I, who I am. And upon this rock, I will build my church, ecclesia. This term, ecclesia, is a governmental term. It means to be indicative or representative of the ones who are sending them. So as members of the church, the body of Christ, we are representatives of those who are sending us to bind and loose. It's a governmental term. It was used of the, those in the Roman Senate. It's just stay standing. I'm going somewhere. Uh, those who would come from different parts of the city-state in Rome to come to the Senate to represent the issues and the needs of the people. It's kind of like where we get our model today of our Congress. In other words, Pastor, this is like a, a solemn assembly. A gathering of people who are representative of those on behalf of others. And, and those who, who come from different parts and different, different struggles and different moments and different places of life. Which is why you can never be ashamed of what your struggle is. Because of your declaration, somebody else gets free. Tonight, I want to leave us tonight with making some declarations that we begin to bind and to loose some things. No matter what it is that you have uh, come out of, if you have come out of any kind of struggle or you might be still in a personal struggle, I want you to meet me at this altar real quickly for some declaration moments. Uh, tonight, pastor, is going to be a little different tonight. Oftentimes, people look for us to lay hands on them to set them free. Uh, but tonight, God wants them to set themselves free. Come on, whatever your situation is, come on, meet me at this altar real quickly, real quickly, real quickly. I'll wait for you. Come on, whatever your situation is, meet me at this altar real quickly, real quickly, real quickly, real quickly. Come on, with every hand lifted, every head up, every head bound. Whatever your struggle is, this is your moment right here. Uh, the Bible says that at midnight, Paul and Silas sang praises unto God and everybody else's bands were loose. Uh, tonight, you're going to make some declarations tonight that are going to set you and other people who are connected with you free. Come on, I wish you would come now with your hands lifted up and with your mouth already open, beginning to worship the Lord your God. Hallelujah. The tonight, tonight's kind of prayer is, is, is not for, 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 for the faint at heart. The, to, tonight's kind of prayer is the kind of prayer for people who mean business with God. Uh, for the get as close around this altar as you can. Come on, quickly, 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 as close as you can. I don't know what your situation or your struggle is tonight, but the Lord wants you to be free in your own spirit. Come on, would you begin to lift your hands before the Lord? Come on. Begin to utter some declarations before the Lord. Begin to declare some liberty and some freedom, some recovery of your own sight of the blind. Woo, Jesus, I feel that now. Come on, begin to make some declarations before the Lord. By the power of Jesus' name. Come on, y'all looking at me. Nobody opening up their mouth yet. Come on, open your mouth. You got to declare yourself. Come on, begin to declare, begin to declare, begin to declare. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift the spirit of lethargy and apathy off of this house. The spirit of discord and lust off of the lives of your people. God, by the authority of Jesus, pornography, be gone out of the lives of your people. In the name of Satan, we bind your work in Jesus' name. The spirit of suicide, God, that it will be lifted off of your people. Nicotine addictions, Lord God, be lifted. Lust spirits, in the name of Jesus, those who are struggling, wondering about what their call is, God, that you will set them free in Jesus' name. Come on, I want you, those of you who have some tongues, this is a good place for your tongues right here. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I know the hour is late. Come on, declare over yourself. Declare over yourself. I am the head and not the tail. I'm above only and not beneath. I am not I have what I have been through. I may have done what they said I did, but I am not who they say I am. 
in the name of Jesus, let the blood, 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 let the blood. Come on, declare over yourself. Come on. Some of y'all ain't saying nothing. You're still spectating. Come on, you have to declare over yourself. You've got to pray and declare over yourself. Come on, you've got to declare and pray over yourself. God, in the name of Jesus, I will come into your season for my life. That I will not miss you. That I will not miss you. That I will not miss you. That I will not be held captive. I will not miss you. Come on. Come on. Declare over yourself. Hallelujah. Deliverance come when we honor God. Can you sing this with me? Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. Glory and honor unto the Lord our God. Come on, worship team people. Y'all get up here and get behind me. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory, honor and power, honor and power unto Come on, one more time. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I promise you the glory cloud is on its way in here. Salvation and glory. Honor and power unto the Lord our God. For the Lord is mighty. For the Lord is mighty. For the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God. The Lord our God. He is one. Sing from your belly, for the Lord our God is mighty. For the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, He is wonderful. Hallelujah, hallelujah. sing it again but I want you to have understanding when you say hallelujah it is a direct assault against the personhood of Satan himself he thought that he would be God in heaven because the worship traveled through the tabernacles of his pipes he thought that he would ascend to the hill of the most high God do you know his name Lucifer Actually, in the Hebrew translation is Halil. When God kicks him out of heaven, he takes the same name, but then conjugates it 
with the meaning of his name of power. Hallelujah. <laughs> so when you say hallelujah, you are making a personal assault against the wicked one. And you're reminding him that the Lord your God is mighty. Can we sing it now? Can we sing it now? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. Honor and power unto the Lord our God. Come on, what's the higher praise? Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation. Nipple. 